following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. continue with our examination of the path of the Bodhisattva, it's good for us to remember, refresh our understanding about what a Bodhisattva is. The term, of course, is Sanskrit. Bodhi means awakened or awakening or wisdom. Sattva is the essence of, or a vehicle for. So in synthesis, we say that a bodhisattva is a vehicle of wisdom, or the essence of wisdom. And of course, when we relate these teachings to the tree of life, also known as the Kabbalah, we know that wisdom is chokmah, which is the second sphere on the tree of life. And so a bodhisattva, properly speaking, is a vehicle of that light. As a vehicle, it is a, in a way you could say a kind of technology or a mechanism, a, a means to transmit something, to transport to carry. And the bodhisattva ideal is expressed in the selfless intention to carry beings to liberation. To be a vehicle for the wisdom, the bodhi, which liberates the consciousness from suffering. And as such, the bodhisattva is merely an intercessor. This becomes particularly vibrant <clears throat> the more you comprehend the nature of the self. In Gnosis, of course, we always study the teachings from the point of view of the Absolute. The emptiness, the Ain, the Ain Sof, the Ain Sof Or. The vast, absolute, abstract space, which is an eternal nothingness, which is something. It is uncreated light. It is in its very essence, the nature of self, but it is not self. It is the essence of being, but it is not being. A bodhisattva is a vehicle of that when a bodhisattva becomes perfected. Those bodhisattvas who are aspiring to become perfected have to work in order to cleanse themselves of the obscurations to that light so that they can become more perfect vehicles more perfect means through which that light can express 
and in turn, <coughs> beings can be liberated from suffering. This is why when we study bodhicitta, which is the awakened mind, the awakening consciousness, or the auric embryo within which the bodhisattva is formed, it's important for us to always remember that bodhicitta is the union of two fundamental aspects. We cannot say that bodhicitta is simply compassion. This is inaccurate. Compassion is only one aspect of bodhicitta. Full and complete bodhicitta is the union of compassion and the comprehension of the absolute. In other words, a perfected bodhisattva, someone who's become a perfect expression of bodhicitta, has two fundamental aspects as the nature of their mind. The first one, of course, is that loving kindness for all existing creatures. And the second aspect is the comprehension of the emptiness of self-nature, the inherent emptiness of existence. These two components are indivisible. So when you study compassion, you must always bear in mind that real compassion is born out of this understanding of emptiness, of the absolute. And that is perfect bodhicitta. For our minds, this is difficult to grasp. And that's why there's a path. The path that we are studying in this course is related specifically to the path that a bodhisattva is working in. It's important to bear that in mind because many of the psychological aspects that we'll discuss in this course do relate to lower or more introductory forms of teaching. But in the specifics, in the, in the structures, in the details of what this course examines is related specifically to bodhisattvas. As a vehicle, as a means through which light is transmitted, or wisdom, we need to look at how that light shines from a bodhisattva. This is not just a allegory. We, as a human person, are a transformer of energy. We have a physical body, which, as you know, is always transforming matter and energy in order to sustain itself. And on the tree of life, the physical body can be represented in the bottom sphere on that tree, which is called Malkut, which means the kingdom. The, the function of the physical body is made possible only because it has within it a vital body, an ethereal body, which in Hebrew is called Yasod, and this is the ninth sphere. In other words, all the functions and activities of the physical body are made possible by means of this vital body, the body of energy. <clears throat> what in Tibetan Buddhism is called the subtle body. In other words, these really are two aspects of one thing. Because without a vital body, there could be no physical body. It would be dead. And the vital body can't sustain on its own. It's intimately related to the physical. But from the point of view of physical matter, we can't perceive this vital body directly because it's in the fourth dimension. We can perceive its activities indirectly with physical senses because we can see that we have the capacity to digest. We have 
energies that move through the body in form of electricity, <clears throat> all the forms of metabolism, etc. All of these functions are made possible because of the existence of the vital body, the body of energy. Beyond this, we have additional components which make us, which give us the capacity to interrelate, which give us the capacity to exchange energy. We, of course, know that we have feelings, we have emotion. And emotion is really, when we experience emotion or feelings physically, that energy is manifesting in our field of perception through our emotional center related to the heart. But its source is deeper than that. It's in a more subtle level of matter, which we call the astral world, which is related to the fifth dimension. And this, of course, is the sphere of Hod on the tree of life. This is called by some the astral body. It's not the true astral body. It's rather a shadow. But it is the emotional body. And through this form of matter, the energy of emotions arises. It passes into us physically. And then we experience the sensations of emotion, feelings of like and dislike, feelings of antipathy or love. All those feelings, those emotional sensations, arrive because they have their root in the astral body, or rather the body of emotion, the kamarupa. But you see, if you look at the tree of life, between these two, between the astral aspect and the physical aspect, is the vital. The vital body is performing an important task here, which we're going to cover in detail in just a few moments. Next to the astral body, or the body of desires, we have the mental body, the sphere of Netzach. And this is what we normally think of as the mind or the source of thoughts, the source of the intellect. This also exists in the fifth dimension and is easily confused with this astral counterpart. When we dream, we experience these realms of the fifth dimension. This is how we personally can taste the qualities of our own subtle bodies by the quality of our dreams. And then beyond this mental body, we have the source of will, which ultimately becomes the causal body. And this is related to the sphere of Tifereth. And as you remember from previous lectures, when any initiate has raised the kundalini throughout these five bodies, from the physical up to the causal, they can then make the choice to become a bodhisattva. So these five bodies are very important for us to understand in order to grasp what a bodhisattva is. And also for us to understand what we are. In their combination these five psychological and material aspects form what we can call our mind. These are what we can call our psyche. They are all forms of energy, and they are all forms of matter, but not limited to third-dimensional matter. The physical body has both its material aspect and its energetic aspect. And so does the vital body, the body of desires, the body of the mind, and the body of will. Each of these has matter in their level. And each of these has energy. In Hebrew, this ninth sphere related to the vital body is called yasod. And that term means foundation. 
in the entire process of the development of a human being, we need a foundation to rest upon. The foundation that we find is precisely the ninth sphere. This is the foundation stone that our own psychological temple is built upon. It's the quality of this vital energy that determines the quality of our building. If you build something with a weak foundation, with an unstable foundation, with a corrupted or impure foundation, that building will not stand. And this is why in the Gospels, the Master Jesus gave a beautiful example that we have to build our temple on the rock, not on sand, not on loose earth. The rock that he's referring to is, of course, sexual. And the vital body is related directly with sexuality. The vital body, this fear of Yasad, can be examined in detail and is seen to have four fundamental aspects. These are called the four ethers. The first two, which you would say are the lower two, are the chemical ether and the ether of life. And by ether, we're talking about levels of energy, certain vibrations or wavelengths of energy. The ether of life, of course, is the energetic force within us related to reproduction. It's the sexual energy. The chemical ether is that energetic force that provides our capacity to digest, to transform energies and foods and fuels related to the physical body, but also related to the mind. Their two superior ethers are called luminous and reflective. These two are related to how we transform impressions. The luminous ether is related with our ability to perceive. Luminous, of course, refers to light. Therefore, within the very nature of our vital body, is the means by which we have perception. But this perception is not limited to physical senses. It includes them, but it goes well beyond that. And the other ether, the other superior ether, is, of course, the reflective ether. And a, a reflective surface is something that reflects light. It's related to the luminous ether. But reflective, in this sense, refers to the capacity of imagination, the capacity of clairvoyance. And these are forms of perception that are more refined, more subtle, also more penetrating. These four ethers, in their combination, constitute the vital body. And it's these four ethers that give us the ability to act physically, it's through this ethereal body, this vital body, the four ethers, that our own thoughts, feelings, and will interrelate with our physical existence. As if you look at this tree of life, you see the three spheres above related to will, mind, and thought, and emotion, rather, pass in and out of this ethereal body to the physical body. Physically, we study our three brains, intellect, emotion, motor instinctive, sexual. But these three brains are just machines that receive and transmit forces. And what they're connected to are these three internal aspects related to these three spheres of will, thought, and emotion. The three brains have aspects related to all the bodies, but fundamentally, we need to study them here physically because here is where we have the little bit of consciousness that we do have. That's why we emphasize the need for self-observation. 
through self-observation, we observe our three brains. We observe our thoughts. We observe our feelings, our emotions. And we observe, we observe the sensations that arise in us and our motor, instinctive, and sexual centers. The reason we observe them is to study our own mind. Because our mind is putting those impulses into the three brains. Those impulses are coming into the three brains because those impulses are arising in our own internal, subtle psychology, which is, of course, these three bodies that we're discussing, these three spheres. The reason this is important for us to understand is that the bodhicitta is elaborated in this world. The bodhicitta is the awakening mind. It is an ethereal, auric embryo. The, bo- the Master Samael Anvior stated that the perfected bodhicitta is the ethereal body. Why? This is because the ethereal body plays a vital role in the management of energy. It is the body of energy. It is that means by which impressions are received and transformed. Because we have our perception, we have our sexual forces, we have our caloric and chemical forces all within this ethereal body. Now, from this point of view, you can understand why it's so important for us to have a clean mind, to acquire chastity. If our own energetic body is impure, if this foundation, the vital body, is corrupt with desire, then bodhicitta cannot be perfected. Our own awakening mind cannot be perfected and elaborated to the infinite degree. The process of arriving at a perfected ethereal body is, of course, initiatic. And the way we can arrive at having a good, having confidence in this path is to maintain and always study bodhicitta, which has these two aspects, compassion and comprehension of emptiness. And looked at from another angle, we can say that the bodhisattva is the one whose will, which is Tifereth, this causal body, has been united perfectly with the divine, with the will of God. In other words, with the absolute. <clears throat> that union, if you look at the tree of life, happens in the central column of the tree. At the bottom of that column, we have the physical body. And immediately above it, we have this vital body. And the next one up is Tifereth, the body of will. So you see right there, between our physical actions and our will, is this vital body. In other words, sexuality. Perception. The vital body, the ethereal body, has to be perfectly cleansed in order to receive and understand the will and act on it. But that will in turn, Tifereth, Immediately above that is the sphere of Da'at, which is the tree of knowledge, which again is sexual. And immediately beyond that is Keter, the crown, which is the first manifestation of the Absolute. The Dharmakaya, in other words. So in this central column, we also see a profound relationship. An energetic relationship, a psychological relationship. For us as a physical person to become united with Dharmakaya, with Keter, 
We have to work with the forces of the ethereal body in Yasod and the forces of will in Tiferet. This is the goal of the Bodhisattva, to unite all of these. And the perfect union of these aspects is made possible by Bodhicitta. Without Bodhicitta, this is impossible. To accomplish this requires a great deal of comprehension of oneself. A lot of understanding about matter and energy. In Buddhism, there are a set of principles that are expressed which help us to understand how to arrive at the perfection of bodhicitta. And in that way, we arrive at Buddhahood, or absolute liberation. To do that, the bodhicitta has to become perfect. And as the expression of the divine, it will express that perfection, divine perfection, which we always think of as virtue. These qualities of the consciousness that are required in order to merge with divinity are called in Sanskrit paramitas. And this term para means beyond. In, in its synthesis, the word paramita means that which is beyond or transcendental. The teachings of the paramitas are very common in Buddhism, in all forms of Buddhism. And in fact, they're common in all religions, but just organized in slightly different ways. In Buddhism, they're usually presented as six paramitas, or six qualities that we need. These six qualities are not simply virtues in the way we think of them. They are rather transcendental. They're beyond common virtues. And the paramitas, in their ultimate expression, relate to the, the trikayas, the three bodies of the Buddha. In that way, we can understand that the paramitas are beyond samsara, this world of suffering. They are beyond nirvana, which is the world of the gods. And instead, the perfection of the paramitas is in non-abiding nirvana, which is a state of consciousness that only a bodhisattva can have. So this emphasizes that the full development of paramitas is possible only for those on the bodhisattva path. To outline them, we'll give you the six primary paramitas that are explained in general. The first one is generosity. In Pali or Sanskrit, this is called dana. The second one is called ethics or morality or discipline. The third is patience. The fourth is diligence. The fifth is concentration. And the sixth is wisdom. These are the six perfections. six paramitas. 
And these qualities are taught in many religions, that it's necessary for us to develop these capacities in order to advance spiritually. But remember, in this course, we're talking about the path of the bodhisattva. Thus, our emphasis is on the transcendental aspect of these qualities. You will discover that these six paramitas, or perfections, are taught in all the levels of the path, according to the capacities of the instructor and the student. Thus, you can examine or investigate how this paramita of generosity is taught. And in a school or a teaching related to the Shravakayana, the foundational path, generosity is taught as how we donate, how we have loving kindness or generosity towards others. We make donations. We try to provide material goods. We try to provide good things to help other people. And the purpose in that practice is to cultivate non-attachment for oneself. This is very important. For the person, the practitioner working in the foundational path, it's necessary to cultivate non-attachment in order to comprehend the I, the ego. <clears throat> for the religion or the student who's gone a little beyond the Shravakayana and is working the Mahayana, this capacity of generosity will be more focused on other people rather than on their own development. So you can see that the generosity has become more expanded, more selfless, more focused on self-sacrifice, giving to others because of wanting to benefit others, not so much for oneself. So this would be the second level of this paramita, the second form of how it's commonly taught. But we have, of course, a third. How this form is taught in the bodhisattva's path. This is where the real transcendental nature of the paramita becomes evident. Generosity in this form is a form of consciousness. It's not merely action. It's not merely intention. It's spontaneous, conscious quality, a quality of mind, which has to be perfected. But that quality of mind, generosity, in a bodhisattva, is one with the understanding of emptiness. It's a form of generosity that gives for the benefit of the other person, but with the recognition that neither the giver or the receiver, really exists. And for us, with the quality of mind that we have, this is incomprehensible. But that is the nature of a paramita in the bodhisattva's work. So these six paramitas are given in a definitive order. They're all interrelated. They feed and support each other. You cannot separate one out. You can't rearrange them. These are qualities of consciousness, qualities of mind. And in the path of the bodhisattva, these six are crucial. We can synthesize them and express them in three steps. Of course, in Gnosis, you know very well we always talk about the three factors. But in Buddhism, they teach the same thing. Of course, Buddhism and Gnosis are the same religion. The Buddha taught, the first thing we must do is to avoid harmful action. That harmful action is towards ourselves and others. And of course, related to the three factors of, Buddhism, of uh, Gnosis, we would say this is the factor of death. To avoid harmful action, our own wrong intentions, our own desires, 
have to die. Those qualities of mind have to die. Otherwise, they will continue to stimulate the impulse to wrong action. The second step is to cultivate or adopt virtuous action. And this is where we, instead of following the impulse to behave in the wrong way, we consciously choose to behave in the right way. This is a form of birth, psychological birth, conscious birth. And of course, the third is to work for the benefit of others. And this is sacrifice. Sacrifice for others. These three factors are inseparable from one another in the same way that the paramitas are inseparable. The paramitas are a more detailed way of looking at the three factors. They're the exact same expression, just in more detail. But for us to perform this work, to actually achieve the accomplishment of these three factors, we have to do it consciously, with conscious will, which means in the moment. It's not sufficient to have intentions. We have to act in the right way. We have to know how to behave and act in the right way. And we do that by learning about ourselves, learning about what real virtue is. But these three, death, birth, and sacrifice, avoiding harmful action, adopting virtuous action, and working for the benefit of others are all rooted in the ethereal body, the vital body. Because it's through that means, the vehicle of our body of energy, that we have perception. Our consciousness, which is really our will, is rooted in Tiferet. And our consciousness is able to perceive here physically because we have a vital body, which is the receiver and transformer of light, of energy. And it delivers those impressions into our mind. If we're not conscious, if we're not paying attention, those impressions are received mechanically by our desires, by our ego, by our pride. And that's how we perform wrong action. That's how we hurt other people. That's how we sustain our selfishness, by being asleep. So the work of the bodhisattva is to invert that, to become conscious from moment to moment. The student learns this in the very foundation of the path, in the vehicle of the Shravakayana, to be attentive. The Mahayana practitioner also learns to be attentive, with more attention on the benefit of others. The bodhisattva has to learn to be attentive with compassion and awareness of emptiness. And it's that awareness, the quality of consciousness, is built upon the qualities of the ethereal body. This is why chastity, again, is so important. The mind and our sexual energy are totally united. Someone who is addicted to fornication, to lust, has a mind that's filled with passion, with desire for self-satisfaction. This is antithetical to bodhicitta. It's poisonous to bodhicitta because lust seeks to feed itself. Pride seeks to feed itself. Anger seeks to hurt other people in order to feed itself. So all of these qualities perform wrong action and hurt other people and feed the self, which are the opposite of these three factors. The work begins with transforming the sexual forces that we have through conscious will, self-sacrifice.
we have to understand that these six paramitas are interrelated with each other, and they build on each other. The bodhisattva who's comprehending in themselves the true nature of generosity is understanding how to perform action for the benefit of others without a sense of self. That means without self-interest. But doing actions because it benefits other people. It can be said that the bodhisattva, when the bodhisattva acts, they act on behalf of others without concern for their own needs. Now that has some subtlety in it. If you read some of the stories of the Buddha, the Jataka tales, the lives from his previous lives, stories of his previous lives, you'll read stories about how, for example, in one lifetime, the Buddha Shakyamuni was a rabbit and a beggar was starving. And so the Buddha, as a rabbit, threw himself into a fire in order to feed the beggar. And this is a symbolic story of self-sacrifice, that he was willing even to give his own physical life to benefit this person that was hungry. The story is symbolic. This doesn't mean that a bodhisattva will always seek ways to die. That moment comes with resurrection, which is exemplified in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. But the bodhisattva really has to learn how to act in the right way at the right time and the right place. This is very challenging. The karma of these times is so deep, so heavy, so complex. It's difficult to know how to behave in the right way. Generosity when developed in the bodhisattva, is this quality of giving for the benefit of others and with the understanding of the absolute. And that naturally gives rise to ethics. Because to know what to do, to know what's right and wrong, is a question of ethics. So the action of generosity gives rise to these ethics. And understanding what's right to do at the right time and place also gives rise to patience which is the ability to withstand circumstances with joy. Not with resentment, not with despondency, but with happiness. And when you have the capacity to withstand difficulties, and this virtue, this quality, transcendental patience is arising, then you're having the capacity to keep working no matter what, which is diligence the fourth paramita. And that diligence is the persistence to keep going. And that quality of persisting, of continuing, of constantly driving towards the goal without giving up is the quality of concentration, which is the fifth paramita. And that concentration, being able to apply oneself without fail, without wavering, without distraction, naturally arises wisdom. And wisdom, of course, as a paramita, is the wisdom of the absolute. The understanding of emptiness, of shunyata. So you can see that these paramitas have two fundamental functions when we study them. They are qualities of consciousness that we need to develop. So we describe the paramitas as uh, states of mind in development, but they are also goals to be arrived at. So the paramita of generosity is something we develop in ourselves, but it becomes, at the end, perfected. <clears throat> and of course, as I said, that has levels. In Buddhism, these six paramitas make up the first six grounds 
or first six levels of the path of the bodhisattva. A bodhisattva who has entered into the direct path receives a very special initiation called the initiation of Tiferet. And they enter into a whole new level of work on themselves, which is not available, not accessible to Pratyeka Buddhas, to Shravaka path walkers. And that Bodhisattva path is very sophisticated. It deals with the complete perfection of our mind, which, as you know, is very complex. It's very messy, the contents of our mind. The Bodhisattva has to clean the entire mind. And in the Greek mythology, this is expressed by the symbol of the labors of Hercules. Those labors are 12, and they relate to detailed psychological works that a bodhisattva has to pass through. This is why in the tradition of Kala Chakra in Tibetan Buddhism, there are 12 bhumis, 12 levels, or 12 grounds that the bodhisattva has to move through to reach absolute perfection. In other forms of Buddhism, it's taught that there are 10, There are many ways to look at this wisdom, but the path is the same. These are just terms to help us develop some understanding to prepare ourselves. So we don't need to get caught up in all the details of the correspondences. But in synthesis, you can say that the ten bhumis, or levels, the first six are these paramitas, and the next four are qualities beyond the paramitas. We'll discuss those in a later lecture. But all of these bhumis, these paramitas, are qualities that feed the deepening understanding of the Absolute. None of them is exempt from that. The Bodhisattva, in its very purpose, is a vehicle of that energy of the Absolute, and though, therefore must understand that energy very deeply. So generosity forms the foundation of all of those paramitas. All of the paramitas, the entire quality of the Bodhicitta, or the mind of a Bodhisattva, has its basis in generosity. Bodhicitta itself is a form of generosity, of acting without self. And this is why it's so important for us to understand the nature of our own internal bodies. In order for the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom of Hokma, Avalokiteshvara, to express through the vehicle of the bodhisattva, the capacitors have to be there. The light bulb. The technology to receive that light and transmit that light. That technology is our own mind. And our own mind is made up of these five fundamental parts which we've been discussing. Physical, vital, emotional, mental, and conscious will. those provide the means through which that light can express itself. The the paramita of generosity provides this foundation. And the bodhisattva who enters the path works first in the bhumi, the level of generosity. The reason for this is very clear. Just because an initiate, a person like one of us, has created the solar bodies, these vehicles, in order to transmit light, 
<clears throat> does not mean they've eliminated the ego. Desire is still very much alive in that person. They are in a very dangerous position. The path of the bodhisattva is extremely dangerous. That's why it's always been taught only to initiates who have proven their capacity to understand it. Generosity is taught in the beginning. It's said as to be the first bhumi because the bodhisattva having ego still has clinging, still has pride, still has selfishness, still has attachment to their own idea of themselves. They have developed some capacity of bodhicitta. Otherwise, they could not enter into the bodhisattva path. They have developed those solar bodies, solar astral, solar mental, solar causal, which can act as transmitters of that light. So they can give the teaching. They can transmit the wisdom. But the ego is still alive, which means they have imperfection. Generosity is the first bhumi because they need to develop that bodhicitta more to focus more and more on benefiting others. The purpose of the bodhisattva path is to benefit other beings. So generosity is the first bhumi. This quality of self-sacrifice is present in every religion. It's present in every teaching. But again, we have to look at it in terms of the triyanas, those levels of teaching. We all know how important it is to be generous and to provide for others. When we're working in the foundational path, we learn how to be generous at that level in order to, to understand ethics in ourselves and to understand karma in ourselves. To give to others because it's a good thing to do but our own self-interest is at the heart there. Generosity in the Mahayana teaching is more focused on the other person, and for the Bodhisattva, even more so. Self-sacrifice is the emphasis. And of course, that is the life of the Bodhisattva, is the sacrifice of self. The Master Jesus was a beautiful example of that in his life story. That his actions, his life, was an exemplification of the path of the Bodhisattva. He gave of himself completely and all for the benefit of others. And all the other great Bodhisattvas have done the same in their way. But none did it like Jesus did. He had a special mission, which, of course, we're going to discuss in these lectures. Generosity comes in three primary forms. The highest form of giving is to give the Dharma, to give the teachings, to give Gnosis. The Dharma the wisdom of Christ is the science through which the soul can be liberated from suffering. This is the greatest gift you can ever receive and it is the greatest gift you can ever give. But it has to be given with skill, knowing what to give and when. Someone who teaches Gnosis or teaches Dharma is like a doctor. As a doctor, you need to know very well the effects of the medicine and the illness of the patient. If you give them too much medicine, they will die. If you give them too little, they will die. So to properly give dharma, 
to properly teach gnosis requires more and more development of bodhicitta, which comprehends both the need of beings and the nature of emptiness. And it's this wisdom, this unification, which gives you the spontaneous, intuitive guidance and direct access to your own being who can give you the guidance you need. The second form of generosity is to give protection. And really, this means to give fearlessness. And if you think about it in your own life, the feeling of being safe is extraordinarily valuable. To live in a state of fear is miserable. Fear of your life, fear of your health, fear of your well-being. This is a miserable state of existence. So to provide someone with a sense of fearlessness, to give them protection, is a huge gift. And again, this comes in levels. There are some people who teach about religion, but they teach it by manipulating fear, by making people afraid. And this is wrong. This is opposed to the way the law of the Christ, the light, is being expressed. It is wrong to spread fear. It's a crime. Therefore, if you're teaching Gnosis or teaching Dharma, you have to develop the skill to teach it without spreading fear. Yet, as a doctor you have to give the remedy and you have to give the medicine. Some people have questioned why did the prophets give us warnings about calamities to come? Why did the prophets say that doomsday is arriving? It just makes people afraid. It just scares everybody. Or why did the teachings keep emphasizing karma and punishment? Why is it always this judgmental teaching, making everybody feel guilty. We have to understand something about the, the teachings. Gnosis expresses the nature of the law. Gnosis does not, in its heart, condemn or judge. Gnosis' wisdom, the light of Christ, is and when we break the law, when we oppose the current, we suffer. Therefore, when we hear of our mistake, we get upset. And unfortunately, some people will teach the Dharma, teach the religion, but in a judgmental way, or in a fear-based way, or saying, doomsday is coming, you better repent now but to stimulate fear. The prophecies are given because they are true. We are in very dark days, and yes, things will get worse. This is the nature of the analysis of the doctor. If you have cancer, you need to know about it. And if you have fear because of that, that's because of your own mind that you have fear but it's better to know that the illness is there than to remain in ignorance. If you're ignorant of it, you can't cure it, and you will die. And this is true of the mind. This is true of karma. We have to know the truth. And it scares people. It upsets people. It makes them angry. And this is unfortunate. This is why it's so important to learn skillful ways of teaching, skillful manners of expression, to learn how to speak in a way that is conducive to the mentality of the recipient, to speak in a way that can be understood, to learn as an instructor how to navigate the fragile psyche of the student. This is a great art form. 
And you see teachers like Buddha and Jesus and Krishna were experts. It's very useful to study their teachings. Because if you aspire to walk this path, you in your way will be a teacher as well. And the more you can learn from those masters, the better. The more skill you'll acquire. The third form of generosity is material goods. All three of these have their value. All three have their importance. All three are utilized by walkers of the path in order to benefit others. Now, it's obvious that the third form of generosity is the easiest. It's a very easy matter to give someone some possession that you have. There is a level or a degree of sacrifice in giving gifts like that. But the measurement is how that gift relates to your own mind. Of course, in the development of the bodhicitta, the perfection of generosity is to give perfectly without any sense of self. And this is the wisdom of the absolute. We aren't there yet. You can particularly see this if you look at our culture. If you look at the world's culture now, what would you see as its reflection of this paramita of generosity? Would you see this perfection at all? If you watch TV for a few hours, do you see the paramita of generosity anywhere? I expect you won't. And I expect you'll see its opposite, which is greed. Our culture, our psyche, our mind, is saturated with greed, with clinging, with attachment. Some of us become so consumed by our attachment to material things that we hoard even pennies and nickels. We hoard little pieces of paper. We hoard anything we can get our hands on. and We stuff our houses with all kinds of things that we never use, but we grasp them desperately. This reflects a quality of mind which produces suffering. In order to cultivate generosity, walkers of the Shravakiana learn how to start by giving little things, material things, making gifts, donations. So in churches and in temples, you always hear of tithing, dana. And this is a sort of moral value that's taught to the lay practitioners and monks and nuns to give a little bit of themselves in order to teach them how to do it consciously. Most of the time, this is difficult. People really struggle. Even giving a few dollars. People have fear, they have worry, they don't give it with their heart. And in the Gospels, Jesus gives a beautiful story, a beautiful little scene about this in the book of Mark says, Jesus sat down opposite the treasury of the temple and watched the multitude putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which make a penny. And he calls his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had her whole living. This is an example or an illustration of that paramita of generosity in the Shravakayana level. The very beginning stages of giving. 
And this widow, this woman, was accomplishing that. But she represents a quality of bodhicitta that we need to develop, which is a quality of giving from our entire being everything we have for the benefit of others. And if you think about it, observe your own mind in your day-to-day life and how your own mind is always seeking to acquire new things. You want to get a better television, you want to get a nicer car, or you want to go to the mall and buy some new clothes, or you need a new pair of shoes, or you want a new pair of shoes, rather. You already have 10 or 15 or 20, but you want a new pair. Or, for example, you may already have a refrigerator full of food, but you want another refrigerator to fill up with food. It's important for us to analyze this quality that we have of accumulating things. And our culture stimulates it at every opportunity. That if we buy this next thing, we'll be happy. If we get the next great car that's coming out, or the next great computer that's just come out, we'll be happy. This is an illusion. And it's directly opposed to the development of the paramita of giving, generosity. Each time we're confronted with these advertisements, with a big sale at the mall, with any kind of magazine or book that's stimulating us to buy something or get something, observe yourself. Observe those impulses, those desires, in your three brains. As a sensation physically, you'll feel that urgency to rush out right now and go buy it. You'll feel that emotional desire that you like this thing. Maybe the new cell phone that's just come out, you really like it. And you feel the thoughts, you see those thoughts in your mind. Well, if I, if I do this and that, then I can go and get it. Observe all those qualities of your mind and ask yourself the question, will this benefit me or will it benefit others? Who will this benefit? Now, in asking this question, naturally, we have needs. Naturally, we need to eat. We need to be clothed. We need a safe and warm place to live. But needs and wants are different. The Buddha taught the middle path to be in the middle of wealth and poverty. Remember in his life story, he started out as a wealthy prince who had absolutely everything. He renounced that and became an ascetic with absolutely nothing. And then he renounced both paths and said, it's better to walk in the middle, to have balance. To have what you need, but no more. In fact, the path of the bodhisattva is the path in which you take what you have and you make it useful for others. Even those things that you need you make them useful for others. And this is a transformation of the mind. You'll see in yourself that it takes effort. It doesn't just happen on its own. You have to consciously perform this transformation in yourself. To learn how to give for the benefit of other people. And when when this quality of generosity, when we're working on this in ourselves, to reduce attachment, to reduce greed, all the other paramitas come into play. Because to really know how to give something to someone else, you need to have some understanding of ethics. What's right and wrong? The right time and place to do it. For example, if you live in a big city you're going to see homeless people all the time. And you see that they have needs. And it's sad to see them suffering. 
but you have to know how to help them. If you go to any particular beggar or homeless person and just give them money, you might be doing wrong action because they could take that money and buy drugs or alcohol, which is harmful. It's better to just buy them something to eat. Then you know that you've done something helpful for them. And this example applies to everything in life. When you want to perform a good action, you have to measure the time and place to be skillful. We also have to look at it in terms of its ultimate effect. When we're trying to develop the capacity of generosity, we have to understand that something that we give in the short term might be harmful in the long term. And this is not a good gift. You have to think clearly, think carefully, and analyze your actions, your impulses, and the circumstances. This is why when we talk about self-observation, we always talk about the three brains, right? The internal state, but we also have to study the events, the external circumstances. Because both of those related to each other produce the given phenomena. You can't isolate one for the other. You have to look at both. So in synthesis, the paramita of generosity requires that we develop a great deal of self-awareness. In the Gospels, Jesus taught... Uh, it's, this scripture appears in numerous books in the Gospels. That if, He said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me. To deny oneself is to deny the ego. To deny our own desires. To deny our own grasping. Our search for pleasure or for security. For self-satisfaction. To feel good about ourselves. To feel proud. To be admired. We have to renounce all of that. This, of course, is death, the first of those three factors. To take up the cross is symbolic of alchemy, the crossing of the two beings, male and female, which transforms energy. This is how we give rise to birth. When you cross a male and a female, you have the capacity to create, to give birth. And this is virtuous action. To follow Jesus, to follow after him, is to live as he did, solely for the benefit of others. And this, of course, is sacrifice. In each of these factors, they apply to every action that we perform. As you move through your day-to-day -day life, apply these three factors. When you're facing a decision, look at that decision from the point of view of these three factors. Analyze yourself and the situation. Look to see, by calming your mind, by calming your heart, and by looking at the situation without desire, without self-interest. Try to see it objectively, as if you were looking at someone else's life, as if you are just an actor. And analyze that situation to see where is the death in this situation. What will die if I act in this particular way? What will be born? 
and who will it benefit? To survive in this day and age, we need money in order to provide for ourselves and pay our bills. Therefore, we need some form of income. Just because you have a job doesn't make you selfish. Yet, certain kinds of jobs or certain kinds of goals that you have related to work can become very selfish. If you're making a decision related to your career, to work, analyze it from this point of view. Are you seeking solely for your own benefit? Or are you considering the benefit of others as well? For example, what would you do if tomorrow you get a phone call and you get offered a job that will pay you three times the salary you're earning now? But it's selling weapons. You might think that's an easy decision, but your mind will start to ruminate on the cash. And your mind will start to say, oh, I could make all that money and I could use it to benefit other people. I could donate all that money to Gnosis. Don't be fooled. The mind is very sneaky. Remember, look at the short term and the long term. Analyze your decisions. Analyze your actions in light of these three factors. Learn how to apply all of these paramitas in your efforts. But understand one thing very clearly. To really comprehend, to really know, you must meditate. In your physical body, with your physical senses, you can only perceive so much. You can perceive what your five senses will show you, which is limited. To go beyond that is to truly apply the paramitas to the situation. Because you see, as much generosity as we have in trying to do the right thing for others, as much as we have in ethics to try to do what's right, and as much as we have of patience to withstand and endure the difficulties of our life, and as much diligence as we have to keep trying, we also need concentration. And concentration in this paramita is not mere concentration the way we think of it. It's actually dhyana in Sanskrit, which is shamatha, shine, one-pointed mind, samadhi. This is the capacity to perceive without the ego, to perceive consciously free of desire. And it's that perception which gives rise to wisdom. Wisdom is how you really know what to do. Let's say you're a Gnostic instructor. Someone comes and says, I'm going to give you a million dollars. And that's all they say. And as a Gnostic instructor, you would say, wow, that's great. I can do a lot with that. So as a physical person, your impulse would be, I'll take it. But if you're more careful, if you meditate, you might discover that there's more to that offer than is visible on the surface. You might see the truth of the nature, the truth of the situation, is that nothing comes for free. Nothing. Everything costs something. So physically, the offer might be there, 
And physically, that's all you can see. But internally, there's got to be an exchange. Something has to be given back. And it may come in the form of a compromise that is not acceptable. This is why, as a sort of extravagant example, you can't rely on physical perception alone. The same is true of a job offer. The same is true of any given situation. There's more to it than the physical part. Remember that we have the physical body. We also have the ethereal body. We also have the body of emotions, the body of thought, and the body of will. And in each of these worlds, there are exchanges occurring, interactions, transformations. If we don't have awareness or perception of those spheres, then we have to be very careful. So try to act in the right way at all times. This becomes especially important for the bodhisattva. The person who enters into the path of the bodhisattva faces immense danger. Because this path of the bodhisattva is a revolution which goes 100% against one's own mind and it goes 100% against the way of the world. Which means there are enormous forces against the bodhisattva. What makes it more difficult is that the initiate who is first working in the foundational and Mahayana paths develops these five solar bodies through the first five initiations of major mysteries. The serpents of fire, which are related to the kundalini of each body. And in the process of accomplishing those works, the initiate is given a lot of help. Through each initiation, there is assistance provided by conscious beings who are assigned to that person to assist them and help them. In other words, the initiate is given light, is given guidance, is given help. But when the person chooses to enter into the bodhisattva path, to go into the path of the revolution, all of that help is withdrawn. The initiate is then on their own. on their own to face their karma, to face the jealous gods, to face the demons and devils, both inside and out. This is why it's so important to do a very strong and rigorous development of bodhicitta. This is why the paramitas are so essential. In order to face those forces and overcome them, It requires a great deal of wisdom. Do you have any questions? To gain what in ourselves first? You know, like, to give out, we must first, I guess, comprehend what is given out of us, what we think. Like, Bodhisattva still has ego, right, on this, on this planet, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, how does he sacrifice everything for others and do all this, but he still obtains ego in within himself? Well, that's the challenge. We all have something to give. Everyone, every person has something to give. We, each of us, are transformers of energy. And each of us has experiences, a level of understanding that can help someone else. And so we have that capacity, everyone, to help someone else. It may not be in a huge way. It may be in little ways. But what's essential is for us to learn how to discriminate how to give and when 
And we have to do that according to our own circumstances. It's different for each person. But in general, in order for us to proceed and develop all the capacities that we have, all those capacities are developed through generosity, through giving. If you look at the state of life, any real happiness in life has come about because of generosity. If you think about that, all the happy, the truly happy things, the truly happy moments come because you have given something to someone and it gives you a sense of joy. Or you've received something that was a beautiful gift and it gives you a sense of joy. And this gives you the inspiration to develop that capacity more. Another way of looking at it is that done skillfully, generosity will always benefit. Greed will never. I'm saying most people are happy, but they're satisfying greed and you jealousy. They walk around happy all the time. Well, when you look at, I'm talking about real happiness. I'm not talking about conditioned happiness. And by conditioned happiness, I mean happiness that relies upon impermanent conditions. For example, if you're happy because you're wealthy, that happy is, happiness is short-lived because you will not be wealthy always. In fact, when you die, you'll lose all of that. Will you still be happy? If you're happy because you're healthy, that's also short-lived because you will get sick and you will die. Well, that's not real happiness. Real happiness is unconditioned. It doesn't rely on conditions. We have to be thankful for your physical body and for your Oh, naturally, body. yeah. We have to be grac- we have to have gratitude, absolutely. What I'm pointing at though is that generosity has the capacity to provide happiness in an unusual way, in a different way. It can provide an influence or an energy or a force that's beyond material things. If you think about the gifts that you've received from your parents, naturally your parents provide you when you're growing up with whatever they can materially, right? But when you become older, you start to understand more about what parents actually can give you, which is discipline, which is love, help with problems, support in cases when they really didn't want to help you. And those kinds of gifts can start to show you something about the capacity of giving, that there's something in giving that's special. So to develop the paramita of generosity means that we understand how to give in the right way at the right time. And anyone has that capacity. The question is about the luminous ether and related to perception. Whether the luminous ether is part of our perception in other planes of existence or if it's just physical. The luminous ether and the reflecting ether are aspects of our ethereal body, which is related to the fourth dimension. This is a plane of existence that manages energy and it forms a sort of um, interface between dimensions. But the vital body, the ethereal body, these ethers are not the root of perception. They are just vehicles of perception. You have eyes in your physical body, which are how you perceive physically. But those eyes function because you have an ethereal body which has this luminous ether which allows the energy of light to be transmitted to your mind. 
So the astral body has its own ways of perceiving. The mental body has its own ways of perceiving, its own senses. These senses are called chakras. And all of the bodies that we have can only perceive because we have consciousness. So consciousness is the root of perception. But consciousness is not dependent on any body. The bodies physically in the fourth, the fifth, or sixth dimensions. The consciousness can perceive without vehicles of any kind. But any vehicle without consciousness cannot perceive. So consciousness is sort of the light that fills the bulb. And if the light isn't there, there's no perception. Make sense? comments made that the ethers of the vital body will act in their own way in relation to each sphere because they are the foundation. This relates to the interpenetrating nature of all the spheres. These spheres are isolated and separated on the structure so that our feeble mind can grasp it. But the reality is that they all interpenetrate. And the truth is that this structure of the tree of life is greatly simplified. When we look at this simple structure, we have to remember that. There are intimate relationships between each of the bodies, between how the astral and mental bodies relate and how the vital body is related to them. On that note, it's important to emphasize once again that the cultivation of this path, the realization of this path, comes through self-development. Through perfecting and cleansing these bodies, which are in synthesis the mind that we have. The primary way we do that is through meditation. The primary mechanism, the force that we use to cleanse the mind is rooted in the ethereal body. It's the sexual energy, the force which gives rise to life. The sexual energy is the same light of Chokmah, the same fire of the Holy Spirit, the same wisdom of Keter, which provides all the elements to create but it also provides all the elements to destroy. The management of that energy is rooted in our mind, in our will, in our thoughts, in our feelings, and how we use energy. The ethereal body with the four ethers is the mechanism through which that energy flows. Energy in our entire psyche is managed there back and forth, in and out, transformed in accordance with the state of that vehicle. When that energy, the sexual force, is utilized to cleanse the mind, real virtue can be born naturally in us. In other words, we can aspire all we want to be a virtuous person, to be a good person, to be generous. But we will never be so long as greed is alive in us. And this is why Gnosis places so much emphasis on the death of the ego. This is why when you read the books of Samael and Vior, there is a constant hammering of the same point 
comprehend the I. Meditate. Comprehend your ego. The intention behind that is an intention of generosity. It is an intention of bodhicitta. It's a wisdom that knows when there is death, then new things emerge. But if there is no death, any new thing that emerges will be corrupt because it will be corrupted by the impurities that remain there. This is the great danger for the bodhisattva. As strange as it may sound, an initiate can create all the solar bodies, can even develop bodhicitta, this generous spirit towards other people and the comprehension of wisdom, and thus enter into the bodhisattva path and yet not eliminate the ego. It sounds strange, but it happens. And it's because there's not enough attention paid to death, psychological death, symbolized in the Gospel by John the Baptist and his decapitation, and by the crucifixion of Christ. If the death does not occur then there is a form of birth that's happening because the bodhicitta and the sexual energy is forming energy to give rise to the paramitas. But the death is not occurring because the meditation is not profound enough. There's not attention focused on the death of the ego. The result is an abortion of nature called a hanas mus, a demon. There's a great danger in this type of practice, this type of study in the path of the bodhisattva. When you start to harness the sexual force, you need to be aware that every day you're using energy, very potent energy. So be sure to use it wisely. Be sure to use it consciously. And be sure to analyze your ego and resolve to change. Meditate on the ego every day. Never forget. The death of the ego spontaneously gives rise to new virtue. It's important as well to emphasize that you should also not simply meditate just on the ego. We need balance. And I'm putting it this way because there are groups of students who meditate exclusively on the ego, who analyze the ego, but they never try to comprehend the virtues. They never try to cultivate the paramitas. You have to do both. The consciousness needs to comprehend the distinction between the two. So if you have an event that happens today that you feel is important for you to understand. Meditate on that event and analyze it from the point of view of these three factors. When you acted, what was born, what died, and who benefited? When you meditate on a scene or an event in which you did behave in a harmful way, Good, meditate on that. Deeply, comprehend it. But also spend a little time allowing your consciousness to show you how you should have behaved. To allow your consciousness to realize the right action. So you have to do both sides. Always from the point of view of who benefits. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. We'll see you next week. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. 
All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,